Thank you, Eric. Um, so, uh, so I'm Dave. I'm a SRE on the compute team here at Twitter. I'm just going to be giving a talk on managing a large-scale large compute platform. Um, so Mesos and Aurora, what are they? What do they do? Um, uh, Mesos is basically responsible for resource management. So um, we have a lot of machines at Twitter and rather than like allocating say full machines to like a service, what we can do instead is um, basically pull the resources from all those machines and then divide up the resources and um, like launch tasks on them. And the idea is to actually drive up utilization by like packing more tasks onto a machine and then driving up efficiency. Um, so some of the resources that we manage are like uh, CPU, memory, uh, disk, and network. Um, the isolation mechanisms that we use, so that's another important thing. You don't want these individual tasks. So you don't want the uh, individual tasks to like interfere with each other. So that's another thing that Mesos provides. And under the hood, it's just using um, C groups and namespaces. So with Aurora, this is a, a sample Aurora configuration. Um, as you can see, there's a job, uh, the first line so we've got here like the cluster, the role, the environment, and the name. These uh, four elements make up the job key, and that's typically how uh, we identify like a job um, at Twitter. Um, you can see below there's an announcer. Um, that job key, uh, that's basically registered in Zookeeper, and that's how like other services, that's how they find each other. Um, so this particular job, there's uh, 5,000 instances. Um, so that's how many tasks or how many uh, how many copies of this job we want sort of spread across the cluster. Um, so the task is, or the job is made up of, um, in this case, like a sequential task, um, which basically means that these, these couple of processes here, they're run sequentially. So the first one you'd be uh, downloading like the application from uh, somewhere, and this is just a made up example, um, and then be running it. Um, you can see here where it's running, um, this application, it's, it's accepting two uh, parameters for different ports. And you'll see here there's these thermos ports. Um, uh, and it, that's basically like a template. So at runtime, um, Aurora is filling in these, um, these with like the port numbers and that's what's, that's what's announced in the Zookeeper. So that's how we um, discover other services. Um, the second one here, you'll see that there's a health. So that's a health uh, the port that the application could be listening on and um, well in this case it's an admin port as well so it might be providing some other um, functionality. Um, Aurora would use that that port's got a um, like a, a well-known uh, implementation I guess of say if you hit up the slash health endpoint it should return a, an okay response um, within this time and if not that task is considered dead and would move somewhere else be started somewhere else in the cluster. You can also see here that we've got some constraints. So there's a, a rack limit constraint um, of five. So that basically means that um, Aurora will uh, try and avoid or will avoid scheduling more than five instances on a specific rack. So that's to, like to avoid or to sort of limit your failure domain. So if a, a top of rack switch dies, um, at most five instances will be affected. You have the same thing there for a host limit as well. So how do we actually configure Mesos and Aurora? Uh, we actually rely on Autobahn uh, quite extensively. Um, so as Eric mentioned, there's, each host can be in a number of groups. So groups for data centers, group for rack, and like a group for the different type of hardware platform. Um, there's also a roles group. Um, that's how machines are allocated to individual teams. Um, so we're responsible for like the shared, the shared role at Twitter, and that's uh, the cluster with like all or a lot of a large number of um, machines, and that's where any um, any uh, that's better. <laughs> uh, so any engineer at Twitter can schedule tasks within the shared pool. A dedicated is slightly different, so um, the shared pool is not appropriate for or some some services. I guess they have specific requirements, say for around state. Um, within the shared pool, you could be scheduled anywhere. If you have dedicated hosts, you can only run on those particular hosts. Um, so that's our way of kind of working around at the moment some of the limitations in, um, say, Mesos and Aurora. 
Um, some of the other attributes we set are Mesos cluster, so that defines the cluster that the, the hosts are a part of, and another one is the Mesos version, and that's actually the version of Mesos that should be installed on hosts in, say, that role or with that attribute set. Um, this is just a sample snippet from Audubon. Uh, one of the things to note here is you can see how we've got Mesos version. It's actually got the attribute set on the role and the server. So in this case, it's going to take the most specific, like when we're configuring the system, it's going to take the most specific attribute, which in this case would be the server, so that it overwrite what's set on the role. Um, one of the other things here is the Wilson state. So this particular uh, machine, it's in the managed state. So uh, it's expected to be in service, operational and, and healthy. Um, it's not allocated, it's not in maintenance, and it's not out for repair. Um, you can see there just some of the other groups as well, like in this particular case that the data center is like US East, which is totally made up. Um, how we actually configure Mesos and manage the configuration, we use Puppet. So um, all the Audubon attributes are available within the Puppet uh, manifest, so we can leverage Audubon basically to target configuration changes to either specific groups, specific platforms, or however we want. Like we can uh, target individual machines if we like just by talking an Audubon attribute. Uh, there's a number of cha uh, challenges with actually using Puppet. Um, one is a slow feedback cycle, and this is probably a, an artifact of uh, Twitter, as possibly an artifact of Twitter's implementation of, of Puppet, but um, we have Puppet running on each machine that runs roughly every half an hour. And our Puppet runs, for various reasons, they take a long time as well. So if we were to change an Audubon attribute to, say, change the configuration on a machine, it's potentially half an hour later before we actually see that change in production. So the challenge there is, well, you don't know if you've broken something until half an hour later, potentially, and it's also half an hour later if you did break it until it's fixed. Um, one of the other interesting uh, things with that as well is because of the number of machines we have, we always have machines running in pop, running Puppet. Um, that actually highlights a, uh, well, it's actually a, a race condition in Puppet. Typically when, when people set up and use Puppet, they'd have their Puppet configuration, all their modules stored in a source control uh, version, say, such as like Git or SVN. And usually, um, how that would be set up, you'd uh, check out that repository on the Puppet Masters and what's on the disk on the Puppet Masters is what's served up to the machines running Puppet. Um, so we can have, say, some machines that are, have started a Puppet run, they've had their, their catalog compiled, but then they're fetching resources from, um, from the masters, but those masters, like, what's changed, like, what's on disk could have actually changed since the, the catalog was compiled. So. That can uh, lead to some interesting problems. Like we had a, a problem a while ago where uh, we changed how we're doing logging and there was a race condition which, well, this, this particular race condition, it's kind of difficult to notice unless you have a lot of machines because it only affects those that are like in the middle of a puppet run. So uh, that led to some interesting trouble. We, we didn't actually notice it until we pushed it out to like all the machines and, and we lost quite a few of them. Um, Interference, that's another uh, interesting problem. Uh, this isn't actually specific to Puppet, um, but one example is uh, we don't actually uh, constrain like what resources uh, things on the host can use. Like we provide resource guarantees about the tasks we run, but not about the, the tasks or the, the services that are running outside of Mesos, and Puppet is one of them. So for example, it could they consume the CPU or memory, and like if other tasks are so closely um, provisioned, I guess, towards their their resources, like what they've actually requested, um, we can actually sort of oversubscribe the machine, and that can lead to issues as well where the tasks are killed. Um, so how we actually deploy uh, Mesos is built as uh, an RPM, so an RPM for each operating system that we supply uh, that we support. Um, and to actually deploy it, it's just a matter of toggling an Audubon attribute to say this version of um, the RPM should be installed. Um, and that allows us to actually roll out um, the changes to a small subset of hosts as well just by toggling the attributes on those specific hosts. Um, typically we get the 
RPM, so I get the bits out to the host, and then we'll change the configuration, like um, enable the feature or, or something like that. Um, so that works well to a degree, but then sometimes we have uh, some interesting deploys. Um, uh, one example of this is we rolled out network isolation a little while ago, and that's all port-based. Um, so as part of that change, we need to change the ephemeral port range that the kernel was um, set to. And you can't necessarily do that whilst the, the host is actually running tasks. It could be using those ports that you're just, just now like saying that it shouldn't be using anymore. So as part of the deploy, we need to drain the host to kill it, to move the tasks off them, um, change the configuration, like change the kernel configuration, even reboot the, boast, the box, and then um, undrain it when it comes back up. So there's a number of challenges around uh, deploying and configuring Mesos, especially like turning on features like that. Another example as well is um, uh, resources that are actually offered up by the host. Um, so that's actually, uh, well, in part of the configuration, we can, res we can change how much, how many resources we're actually reserving for the host. Um, but for various reasons, you can't actually change them within Mesos whilst there's tasks running. So that's another example where you need to drain the, drain the host first to move the tasks off, change the configuration, and then undrain them. Um, how we're actually able to do this, uh, Aurora has a um, support for um, SLA-aware draining. So we have an SLA where 95% of produc a production jobs tasks must be running for at least 30 minutes. So the idea there is to prevent um, or to avoid taking down like a large number of instances for a specific job. So if you had a job with like 100 instances and you took them all down at once, like clearly whoever started that service wouldn't be happy with you. Um, this graph here is actually uh, a graph of uh, when I was doing kernel updates a little while ago and you can see um, typically it'd be flat normally or hopefully at 100%. Um, but whilst we're doing drains and like rescheduling things throughout the cluster, um, yet the, the SLA of some of the jobs like dips below, but the, the entire platform never drops below 99.8%. So uh, things don't always go to plan, unfortunately. Um, one, of, one of the ways that we actually detect problems is uh, the scheduler has metrics for uh, counting the number of lost tasks by rack and a, lost, a task basically goes lost when, uh, well, Aurora Mesos doesn't know what happened, so um, basically the host disappears and you no longer know, like, well, the tasks that were there, they're no longer there. Um, so here, obviously, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is accounts and the number of tasks that were lost. And each of these colors here, uh, that's a color per rack. So this was actually when I was doing scale testing the other day in. Um, against one of our test clusters, but using machines in production and, and or tasks running in production. And the tasks running in production, I think, were being preempted and, and killed. And that's why, like, basically, since they were, like, emulating or being hosts, all these tasks that they were running were being lost. So um, that's a, a good way of detecting when uh, things are going wrong. Um, so yeah, if you see that in production, it's kind of scary, but also kind of pretty, because it lights up like a Christmas tree. Um, so dealing with faulty hardware, uh, Mesos, we've actually got mo well, a lot of the oldest hardware within the fleet. So we always see failures, hardware is constantly failing. Um, some examples is say disks failing. Um, we have tools to actually detect that and raise um, well, tickets with our site ops team to go out and fix the hardware. Uh, some examples is, yeah, like disks failing, we use um, uh, the smart, like the self-monitoring and reporting tools built into the disks, if, they, if that reports that the disk is failing, we'll, we'll raise a ticket with the site ops and have them go and fix it after training the, the host, of course. Um, sometimes hosts just stop responding. We don't know why. Like, we weren't able to detect that, say, they had a bad disk, for example, or something like that. What we tend to do is uh, our philosophy is to reboot it, see if that fixes it. If it doesn't, reinstall it. If that doesn't fix it, it's site ops problem. <laughs> uh, so I guess the, the conclusion is that the tooling matters. So 
we've got so many machines that we can't do things manually like we need tooling to, to basically automate all of all of the problems that we regularly see otherwise we just yeah we drown doing manual tasks so um, yeah that's essentially it automate all the things that's the solution uh, questions <laughs> there was a lot about um, Audubon. Uh, so who here doesn't understand or doesn't know what Mesos and Aurora do? A couple of people. I might skip that then. <laughs> um, or maybe I shouldn't. Uh, so the idea is to, you've got a, lo a lot of computers um, you want to drive up the utilisation and the efficiency of them. So, one way of doing that is to uh, basically run lots of lots of tasks on those machines. Um, if you can do that, like I guess most workloads are diurnal, so like you have peaks and troughs. So, during the the troughs, I guess you want to um, well, you you want to like try and pack as many things on there so like when the troughs like during the troughs you could say for example run batch jobs in in those like when the when the capacity is free like when it's available um, so that's basically like what Mesos and Aurora you're trying to do um, was there anything in particular that you wanted me to cover This one, yeah, it's it's basically like a job configuration. So this is actually a a Aurora an Aurora configuration file. So it's a domain specific language. It's, in, it's written in a domain spe specific language that kind of resembles well, kind of is Python. Um, it's called Pistachio, and um, is one of the things it does is uh, like type safety and um, these templates as well. So you can see there with um, the thermos ports, for example, and that's how we allocate ports at runtime. Um, yeah, we leverage Audubon, um, sample Audubon attributes. Um, is that good? You mean for like uh, network? Network. So you notice. Um, Networks is kind of tricky. We haven't, oh, I say we haven't fully implemented, well, we, we, we have an interesting setup um, where it's all port based. So um, we actually, you notice here within the configuration, like you're not actually specifying the amount of network resources that you want. Um, we actually um, have a, a set limit on the shared, um, hosting the shared pool. Um, and that's just so that any one task can't monopolize the entire um, bandwidth. So we, I think we have it set to, I think it's about a third of like the bandwidth available on a host. So you are still kind of oversubscribing, but you are also preventing like a single task from monopolizing bandwidth. Okay, um, when was the um, I'm not sure what you mean. We probably not. Like all we do is, like from our point of view, for the network, for network isolation, is just setting like the bandwidth caps on each host, and that's then it's just like a free for all on those tasks, like between the tasks running on those boxes. <coughs> okay. So the question is, we we measure utilization? Uh, yes, we do. Um, each each host. So part of part of Aurora is um, there's another component called Thermos which runs on each host and that kind of provides a, a web UI into like the task running on those hosts. One of the other things that it does is um, provides uh, statistics like or uh, sort of aggregates statistics about the tasks running on those those hosts. But yes we do we do collect metrics and um, they are sort of exported into like a, our analytics pipeline so we can see like the utilization of, across the cluster. Thank you.